In the world of established and iconic wine brands, Penfolds really sticks out. And I'll be honest, I've had my opinion sort of chopped and changed somewhat about Penfolds because as much as I want to regard them as a, a big iconic wine brand, as much as I know that they are owned by, you know, a large uh, publicly listed um, uh, company, um, you know, as much as I see their sort of massive winemaking facilities, I also see a few other things uh, that have really only become apparent to me in the last three years, particularly running this channel. Uh, one, uh, their wines blind taste really well, and we've actually showcased that multiple times on the channel. Two, how respected they are internationally. Uh, they are also some of the most innovative wineries. Now that's really controversial to say because how can a winery so big be so innovative? And I, I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. I just think it's really, really cool when people have like large amounts of resources that they're willing to do stuff like physically fly wine uh, from one country to another to do multi-country blends, but actually at a upper echelon, at an upper tier quality level, which equally, I'd probably say that Penfolds has supported us uh, by sending us, sending us samples, sending us quite expensive samples, uh, also opening up um, you know, their cellars and their time to us, they've definitely done the most than any other brand has. And I don't think I don't think we would get that from, from many large brands. Uh, I think that's very fair to say. So we sat down uh, with Peter Gago, the uh, chief winemaker for Penfolds the other day. Uh, and it's taken me, you know, 24, 48 hours to, to absorb the conversation that we had there. He is an incredible human being. You could take um, the, the Penfolds moniker away from Peter, you could take all the stuff that he has achieved, which is immeasurable really in the industry. I would still want to sit down with Peter and talk to him just about wine, just in general. And also about music, uh, about art, about literature. The guy's an exceptionally well-learned individual. So I, I've been talking enough here. You guys want to get into the uh, the chat that we had. One of the best chats that uh, I've had since we started the channel in the last five years. Big thank you to Penfolds for opening the doors for us. We got the whole uh, backstory, we got the whole uh, what goes on behind closed doors. Uh, and it is very impressive, if a little uncouth at times, but there is some pretty deep thinking going on there. Um, so you'll get to see a bit of an unfurnished look uh, at what goes on behind the creativity of Penfolds from Peter Gago's perspective. Hope you enjoy. Where I wanted to start though, was a bit of an uncouth uh, start, was okay. you, you obviously, 1989 was when you started working Started here, here. yeah. Sparkling winemaker. Yeah, yeah, applied and literally day one was a job as a winemaker. And that was a byproduct of coming top of the course at Roseworthy because as a mature age student, I didn't want to work my way through and then one day become an assistant winemaker and then one day become, mm. because that's in effect, and we won't talk about teaching, why I left teaching because, um, you know, I could have become a vice principal within five years, but then about another 20 years to become a principal. And we had a very politically active principal at the time who fast-tracked me. So I was a year-level coordinator, as a science coordinator at like 23 mm. of 19 teachers, all of whom were older than me. So it wasn't me being ultra-ambitious or whatever, but I did realise coming in a bit later, I had to do things quicker. So, um, yeah, I had a few job offers, and one of them was at Penfolds, but as a winemaker, so that was good. How, obviously, sparkling winemaker as well was With your, Ed Carr, yeah, with, yeah, with yeah, Ed Carr. yeah. And Ed and I were just, if I had my mobile phone, we're just, um, my iPhone, uh, we were texting yesterday trying to get something happening in terms of getting together. We're still keeping very close contact. What do you mean by so, uh, something happening personally or something happening? Oh, no, just like, personally, we're socially. No, no, socially, no, no. Well, later, he's just left, hasn't he? He's of with the hand-picked wines now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what happened to Penfold Sparkling Wines? I understand you've got the champagne... Uh, the resurrection of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, as per in my office, you know, when we launched those wines, we had the 1912 Minchinbury alongside the 2012 Tino Penfolds. And this year, we will have two wines coming out, a non-vintage rosé, which is already out, rebadged, and a non-vintage cuvee, which will only have Penfolds on the label. Really? Now, the CIBC, the most regulatory of all regulational groups on planet Earth, for that to have happened 20 years ago, whatever, it wouldn't have happened. But via our friendships in Champagne, via our associations, by doing it right, and the words of the CIBC were, uh, Tino and Penfolds, you've done it right, right from the start. Mm. So they've got confidence in us now, and, you know, in our sort of roads into China and other mm. obscure markets that quite often even the Champenois have difficulty with. 
mm. we're going with them. You know, good business is everyone wins. And even that's a Chinese thing. But in the instance of champagne, um, we're winning, certainly. But your question, uh, we, in 1993, when a decision was made to move sparkling wine out of our New York to a winery, and, you know, that winery, well, that facility was state-of-the-art with robotics and Terrion equipment and whatever, there was a move to make the, the transition to Great Western of Sepult. And then it moved from there, from Sepult to Caradoc, and now it's moved from Caradoc back into the Barossa. Oh, so wow. that whole sparkling wine movement uh, transitioned geographically. And that's when Ed Carr left in 93, and that's when they created a new role for me because I wasn't going to go to Great Western. Yeah. Uh, and I entered the red wine department, what's that, 31 years ago. Was that uh, when they moved the sparkling to Great Western? Was that when Warren Randall was there? Warren had left not long prior. At the time, uh, Mick Klusko was there. And Sue Hodder. Sue was oh, in right. viticulture there. She went to Winds and Coonawarra, I think, a year or two after that. I'd have to check. But around that period, yeah. When Peter Douglas left Winds and then a little later, Peter Bissell left or vice versa. They left within a very short period of time and Sue stepped in and has done a brilliant job ever since. So obviously Penfolds eventually started to transition away from sparkling wines. Well, we went wines. through a, a stage of abeyance. You know, a lot of the wines that were in the system continued to go through, remembering that you can keep these wines on lees for many, many years. Mm. So in those days at Penfolds, we were making the Mention Breeze, we were mm. making other remnants of like kinds of stool wines, mm. still left over in pressure tank. And all of those were done behind the Kaiser Stool building proper. And then we were making all the Method Champenois wines in a cellar devoted purely to Method Champenois. So all the Seabews, the Kilowaras, the Edmond Mazures, the Pinot Noir Chardonnays, which were winning at the time, every trophy going, uh, all up to about 1993. Ancient history now, isn't it? I say 1993, 31 years ago. Goodness me. Yeah. So obviously it, it strikes me that Penfold is being, being quite an established company. I wouldn't necessarily say, I mean, look, I wouldn't say it's small, but I wouldn't necessarily align it with being large either, not in the scale that, that uh, we see large Australian no, wine no, brands. No. By volume, a lot of people think we're bigger than we are. Mm. Um, we're significant, you know, mm. in terms of size, but we're not this huge behemoth. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I've often joked, and at the, at the risk of repeating myself, you know, journalists around the world have always asked, oh, yeah, what do you want Penfolds to be? And in this context, we want Penfolds to be the world's biggest boutique winery. <laughs> and I think philosophically and in yeah, true yeah. meaning, you step back from that and you think biggest boutique winery, that's sort of what we are. You know, at the top end, we're still handcrafting. Mm. Our obscure new wines are very much what a boutique winery would do if they could. And, you know, the mentality should be, you know, act big, think small, think mm. small, act big, whatever the thing is, yeah. you know, like... That's what uh, I'd like to think Penfolds is. And it always has been innovative, but with tradition backing it up. So it's an ambivalent sort of very modern, very innovative, very traditional, mm. not steeped in our ways, always. You know, back in the days of Ray Beckwith, it was cutting edge winemaking. Mm. Uh, back in the days when, well, Max Schubert, Grange mm. at the time, that's why he had to hide three of the vintages here. No one understood the style at the time. Of course. So that's never stopped, you know, as recently as last year with Kim Schroeder, our white wine maker, he loved it. We, you know, I wanted to come up with that V and we ended up bottling it V Chardonnay, which is five vintages of Yatana in the one bottle. Now we could do that with our reds a lot easier, a lot more forgiving with our mm. G3, G4, G5. Mm. But Kim, uh, we asked him to do a little quote for the release of it. And I looked at the quote and I said, oh, Kim, I'd sign that anonymous, not Kim Schroeder. And what do you mean? Because the words were, it won't work, it'll discolour, <laughs> it'll oxidise. <laughs> oh, and Peter Gogo might be Penfold's chief winemaker, but it was, a, <laughs> it was a big but. Now he thinks it's the best thing since sliced bread. Well, creativity is not an easy process, though. Like, no, and no, often, obviously, no. we, can, we can look through just what Penfold's have really done in the last 10 years, which is it vexes people to see 
uh, you know, the multi-vintages. The multi-regional stuff was, it's, it still vexes people today, but you guys have almost seemingly yep. sort of moved so far beyond that it's not funny. But I'm fascinated to know what, what is on the cutting room floor? What didn't make the cut of all the creative ideas that you came up with? Yes. Well, look, lots of things fall by the wayside. And it's like talking to someone who punts, you know, at the races. You hear the wins, not the losses. But I often talk about the company that preceded Treasury Wine Estates, of which mm. we're part which preceded Foster's, which preceded mm -hmm. Southcorp when we in the old, you know, Penfold Wine Group in the 90s. It was a golden period and we made more mistakes then than we do now, but they fell by the wayside because mm. you're heading there. And uh, the, the whole ambition of trialling is what this is all about. So trials in their very essence are experiments with many failures. But when you get something right and it's not right the first time, wow. You know, like mm. our whole, and some things happen by default. If I can use for an example, our uh, Californian project, uh, we now have five wines, including a single vineyard wine representing terroir. But when we were there doing exactly what we do here at McGill or in the Barossa, their classification tasting in the first year, We'd sent across samples, and you might have heard this story before with wines mm. of the world and the derivation, the genesis of that. Mm. Uh, that was never planned. It didn't go through a focus group. It happened by accident. It happened by default. Earlier in the day with a few of our American colleagues, uh, Andrew Bourbon, now red wine maker, and myself were in the room, and we spent the morning calibrating palates because in California, like here in Australia, we pay growers on end use. Yes. So we can't be going to California and saying, oh, Baldy and I, that's B1, and they're saying it's A1 or B2 mm. and it's C2. You know, you paid on end use. Mm. So we had a palate calibration session in the morning. So anyway, we come to the afternoon, we're classifying, we put the wines together, and there's this new wine, and at the time it didn't even have a name. It became BIN 149. Um, the reason being, and I'll tell you the reason in a few moments, and remind me if I forget, but we put this blend together and they were so pleased with this blend. And I'm very diplomatic, but when it comes to wine, I'm brutal. And I said, look, this wine, this blend, it's great, but it's not harmonious. It needs some gel. It's all spikes and beautiful fruit, whatever, but it's not complete. We need something to bind it. Mm. So we went to all the samples because you do all of this blind and then went back, nothing worked. And anyway, I'm thinking there's this plush, lush wine we had this morning and I went for it, we need something like this. And we put it together and jaws dropped. It was truly a magical experience. You know, I've seen very few in winemaking and wow, what happened? And this thing just brought everything together. And it was like bucket chemistry, it was about 15% of this edition. And the name BIN 149 came, it ended up working arithmetically to a 14.9%. 149, inclusion of a South Australian Cabernet into the Napa Valley Cabernet. So it had nothing, By default, but it not had nothing planned. to do with label integrity? Label integrity. Well, I went back to Australia with Baldy, you know, tail between our legs, like, is Are this legal? Are we gonna legal? seriously suggest no, this? No, no, is this legal? Can, it, can we do this? you didn't even know at the time had whether no or not you could, you could yeah. blend multiple countries together. No, not as such, not like that. And I put our legal team into overdrive and then, yes, you can. And the term wine of the world came into being. Yeah, because it's like wine just, of Australia, wine of America, yeah, yeah. wine it's of... a wine of the world. And we did the same thing with Quantum, which is the flagship Sandalion, you know, yeah. alongside Grange, but the Cabernet didn't work, so we had a bit of leftover Shiraz. That was 13% Shiraz in the first Quantum, because on the back of 149, but we didn't get the magic and jaw drop. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. just, we evolved that way. We tried all the Cabernets, including the ones in the corner from the morning's mm. palate calibration session. Nothing worked. Oh, try a bit of Shiraz. Oh, hey, all right. So do you know what I mean? Like uh, those sorts of things that didn't fall by the wayside, but it could have quite easily. Mm, you could have now, walked away at that yeah, point yeah. if we didn't just try Absolutely. that one last little yeah. idea. But a lot of the blends uh, in winemaking, there's, you know, is it alchemy? Is it science? You've heard all that sort mm. of stuff before, but a lot of it is luck. A lot of it is courage. Like at G3, who would have thought mm. dealing with our flagship, putting those together, mm. very, very super high risk, hence the price. Mm. Most of that could have imagined that trial if that had fallen onto the floor. Mm. All those bottles, like G3 was only 1,200 bottles, but G4 and G5, and they'll only ever be three, they were 2,500 bottles. That's a but tiny now, amount of wine. It's a tiny amount of wine, but when you think of it, 2,500, that's two and a half million dollars worth of shelf price equivalent as an experiment. Two and a half million. 
But if you were to equate it with you know wine on the shelf. I mean, the G4 and G5 went were definitely groundbreaking. At least I, I'm not aware of any any sort of multiple uh, vintage blends at that sort of quality. But G3, I mean, Laurent Perrier with the Grand Seco have been Grand doing Seco. this for, yeah, for yeah, yeah, yeah. quite a while. Yeah, it's yeah. been quite established. And uh, Vega Sicilia, there, um, yeah, uh, exceptional. Exceptional, yeah. yeah, yeah. But it wasn't modelled in any of that. It was just what if, you know? And then, oh, hang on, give it a go. But experimentation, trialling, that could have fallen by the wayside and it didn't like G5. And it's not just gimmickry. G5, I think, now is up to about seven 100-point scores around the world. So this isn't gimmickry. This isn't <laughs> like... And we did an event in uh, the Hansi Club in, um, in Hamburg not so long back and very, very serious clientele. And we opened three bottles of their stock, which is even better, Three of G3, three of G4, and three of G5, because these are not inexpensive wines. No, in no, fact, no, yeah. G3 currently, if you get your iPhone out, go to Wine Searcher, put in Penfolds G3. Who's who, doing yeah, this off camera it, at the moment? It was, yeah, <laughs> Penfolds G3, Wine Searcher. It was released at $3,200 a bottle. You'll never sell it. Sold out in one calendar week. We sold it. But that was at 3200 When you look up Wine Searcher, press Learn More, and it gives you an average global price. Current average global price, $35,454. So that was a stupid idea, wasn't it? <laughs> wasn't that a ridiculous idea? You know? Wow, so does that give you a lot more confidence to take more well, risks? Well, it's a great thing for Australian wine. You know, I, I still Huge. wear the hat. You know, I'm an ambassador for the great wine capitals, which mm. is why we do reasonably well in some of the markets where ordinarily we'd be there from Penfolds, keep them over there. Mm. You know, I'm not saying I deceive people by wearing multiple hats, but um, I've often said of those luxury aspirations, and when you use the word luxury, it sounds very sort of ugh, pretentious mm. or whatever, but it shouldn't just be the domain no pun intended, of the mm. French. You know, why can't Australia do that? So a lot of people in Australia admire what Penfolds is doing because, you know, we're creating... That's what Granger's always mm. done, the thin end of the wedge and others follow in the wake. Of course, yeah. So begrudgingly, you know, Penfolds, big, bad, awful. Well, most of the time, <laughs> but not always. And, uh, yeah, we do create those sorts of things, like our ampule. Mm. When we did that launch, we did in Moscow, at the Baccarat Club, very politically incorrect now, but you know, when back we then, did it yeah, back yeah, in course, 2012, yeah. wow. And the owners of the Baccarat Club at the end of the day was French, and they said, oh, we could never do that in France. And I thought, we did that, little old South Australia. You know, like, it's bravery, courage, the wine has to be, that's a given. The mm. wine has to be 100 points, A1, call it what you mm. will, that's a given, and we can do that. Just as we have for many, many years in America and elsewhere, I think we're the only wine in Australia now to have spoken and held court with two grand tastings. Mm. It's a thousand people plus. Like in Vegas, we did one once for Wine Spectator, 1,275 people, eight vintages of Grange. I can still remember hyperventilating early that morning, smelling all the bottles. 72 bottles of each wine of each vintage to get around the room. The ballroom at the Venetian, you couldn't even see the far wall and there were lights and all sorts. And, you know, we've done that, we've held court. That costs us enormous amounts of money, but it raises the tide of mm, quality everyone. and aspirational Australian things. Well, taking yeah. a step back, Win 149, what's the actual, can you describe to me the logistics of, of a multi-country blend? Yep. How does that yep. actually work? Well, look, in America, it's easier to do than in France, because we've done it in France as well with our Dort mm. liaison. There, it's illegal to bottle a multi-country in France. So we have to ship their wine across, or dare I say, it costs us a lot of money, hence the price. We air freight it across. In Un unbottled? Unbottled, raw wine pre-blending. So it's finished wine through Malo in cuboidal one metre cube or thereabouts, yeah. stainless steel. Oh, right. With an expansion tube, all temperature monitored on an aeroplane. Can you imagine the cost? Jesus. So. That comes here, whereas our American wines, we only have to send a little bit of our wine. I mentioned 14.9% for 149 and 18, yeah. or 13% for quantum in the 2018 quantum. So yeah. it's a small amount of the blend. We send that across. There is a limit to what we do, just as, you know, we've 
dabbling now in Bordeaux with originally Cambon de la Pelouse, mm -hmm. then Gironville and Bellevue for the vineyards, mm. and then only a year or so back buying Chateau Lannison, mm. over 400 hectares. There are actually two chateaux on the property, one of which is completely dilapidated, which we're going to fix up, the other one livable, but one day that will be fixed up to a higher level again. Wetlands, all sorts of things, it's magnificent, right on the junction of saint julien so this is the next 180 years for Penfolds. This is why you get out of bed, you know, like, oh, it's, it's, it's amazing. And this is why with a Penfold winemaking team, like currently we have Shabon, uh, sorry, Shauna, we have a Siobhan as well. She looks after the Barossa. Uh, but Shauna Basto is over there in France at the moment. Wow. A fellow who's looking for me at the moment here at McGill during this interview, Matt Wu, he's working for us in, um, in China, but not right. full time. Reno Lu's there full time. Uh, Andrew Baldwin, Baldy, and Steph Dutton in the Americas yep. for vintage classification. And obviously I am involved in all the classification tastings. So in this place here, our spiritual home, 1844, we outgrew Nagil. All the hills behind us were covered in Penfold vineyards. Mm. Now all suburbia encapsulates the winery. Mm. They had to move. It took them till 1911 to get to the Barossa to build the winery there. They had a small winery in Eden Valley. They had a small winery in what they called then Southern Vales, McLaren mm. Vale. Um, they outgrew McGill. So just as we outgrew McGill and went to the Barossa or to Clare or McLaren Vale, Coonawarra, now we've jumped an ocean or two. That's mm. the next 180 years, as earlier mentioned. How... <laughs> How much does it start to push away? You mentioned that Penfolds, there is like a limit to what you can do. Mm. Doesn't look like there's a limit to what you can do. I mean, what well, is, with, the, well, is there? Are they there is a limit around there, what you there have will to be. not touch? Well, there are things where you, you know, I mentioned the word gimmickry earlier. Like you can't be all things to all people. You used mm. to be my throwaway line, mm. but we give it a go. <laughs> you know, like, but there is a limit now logistically and pragmatism, you know, we've been hugely helped by computerization, mm. hugely helped by being able to put stainless steel on jets that only take a short mm. time to get across. You know, to do that now, years ago would have been cost prohibitive, now you can actually talk about it. So, but where will this stop? Who's to know? But even China, you know, China was all about skin in the game, really. You mm. know, offering scholarships in local villages and whatever, mm dealing with people in a way that's not just tokenistic, that's real. And that's, the, that's a throwaway line here too. As mm. long as it's real, mm. that's the thing. And with Penfolds, in my 35 years here, it has been not 100% real because nothing is, but asymptoting to 100% real. Yeah, there needs to be some sort of underlying meaning. Yeah. Some actual well, the term I've, I've steered away substance. from so far deliberately, but I'll have to raise it as this thing called house style, which, mm. of course, we borrowed from the Champenois. Of course. And uh, I often joke about the Penfold red stamp. You know, you go to a, a glass of uh, red wine and it's Penfolds or whatever, then is it 707 or is it 407? Is it Grange or is it RWT? But they're unmistakably mm. Penfolds. Now, mm. Is that the made, way to make red wine? Not necessarily, but it's the way that Penfolds does. So even those wines in California, in Bordeaux, and now China still have that Penfold stamp. Mm. Now, the raw material, the ingredients, is, of course it's different, but it's as different as Kunawara is to the mm. Barossa. You know, probably the difference between Californian Cabernet and Kunawara Cabernet isn't as great as the difference as it is with Tempranillo we use, or Shiraz, mm -hmm. or different styles, but all with that mid-palate richness, that generosity of flavour, that uh, propensity to age, all of these little dot points that must accompany mm. our wines, whether it's at Canunga Hill level, the Shiraz Cabernet, or whether it's a Grange or special bit. So is, it, is that actually part of the, the sort of conversation that you guys have, the discourse here Absolutely. about we're looking for, like you just mentioned, like mid-palate sort of fleshiness and weight. Mm. One of the questions I, I really I was dying to ask you, which I just noticed obviously in the lineup, it's very much Syrah, Shiraz, <coughs> Cabernet, no matter where we are in the, in the yep, world, yep, um, yep. Chardonnay. Yeah, yeah. But not Riesling. Uh, Riesling is big. Riesling's still big. Our Bin 51 Eden Valley Riesling. And Kim Schroeder, a white wine maker, the last two years of Polish Hill Riesling. Um, do we want to go to the next level? Yes. And why was it? 
Chardonnay for your Tana, not Semillon or Riesling or whatever. And I often, it's such an easy story and explanation. Uh, with Chardonnay, the Burgundians had done nine tenths of our job for us. Cool. If you think of the most expensive wines, and I'm not talking Ikem or whatever, yeah. but they're all Poligny's, Chassons, Courton Chardonnay's, Le Mans. They've already got, this is worth it. Mm. Now what we have to do in Australia is get close to that sort of halo. Mm. And uh, I think we can do that. But we're not gonna see a $300 a bottle Riesling? Uh, you could one day, never say never. And look, a super Riesling like, gee, there are some great Rieslings and certainly the Germanic sort of benchmarks are right up there. And there mm. are some Australian ones there mm. now as well. But what, and I won't cast dispersions here, is the most expensive Riesling in Australia over $100 a bottle yet? I suspect not. I wouldn't know. I suspect not. No. Yeah, no. yeah. So, you know, maybe if we were to get serious, and it's not we can do it and others can't, but you have to buy into that yeah. and raise, and look, that's part of our responsibility too. So we should be doing things with Riesling. So that's mm. a big, you know, sort of future endeavour. But in the interim, our bin 51 comes out every year mm -hmm. uh, out of Eden Valley. The occasional bottle age Riesling out of Clare and Polish Hill under the Cellar Reserve label. This is part of the uh, one thing that you've spoken a lot about is this top-down approach, which I think is fantastic. Um, not many companies do this idea where, um, you know, if you're going to do something, do it the absolute best. <coughs> allow the uh, iterative effect to apply yeah. Uh, yeah. on um, yeah. a ranges below that. Is this part and parcel of the reason why, look, if we're going to do Cabernet, let's go to Bordeaux or let's go to California? Um, partially, partially. A lot of that too is risk management, broadening the base, you know, like, and it sometimes works and it sometimes doesn't. Like, for example, in the year 2020, there were fires in Tumbarumba. Yep. There were fires in California, as there were in mm -hmm. 17 in California. So, you know, spreading risk with fires and or whatever. Well, you know, globally, we've got this thing to contend with, mm. climate change. But just as in the old days, and I'm generalising hugely here, in a hot year, we'd just go south, you know, to a mm. cooler. In a cooler year, we'd use more Barossa, McLaren, Valclair material mm. in some of our blends. So we had that flex from a sourcing perspective. Now we have a whole country thing, you know, like in some great years, like I think around the world, 1990, great mm -hmm. Burgundy, great Bordeaux, birth, yeah. great, <laughs> great, you know, Australian wines in 90. Course, you know, yeah. It happened in 2010, but it doesn't happen that often. So it's agricultural risk and management of agricultural yeah. risk in a way. Yeah, yeah. How, how have you, or in your thoughts, how do you think Penfolds have managed to transcend um, you know, multiple regions, you know, multiple vintages, you know, aren't, with notable exceptions, known for elevating the price of wines. They're usually associated with cheapening the price of wines, but you guys seem to trounce so far above and beyond that, it's not funny. Well, I think, again, because of a track record and this thing called cellaring, which is, you know, I often say, yeah, I'm sort of a winemaker, but I started off as a wine lover who became a wine collector and then the winemaker bit came later because of a right. previous career. And I think just salaring and going on a journey with wines and generations of Australians have gone on the journey, not necessarily at Grange level or special bins, but with 389 and bin 28. And that's what our book, The Rewards of Patience, is all about. And there is a confidence in these wines that inspires people to, you know, salar them. And as a result of the salaring and the track record, they're willing to pay more. So for example, mm. a case study, 2008 bin 620 Kunora Cab Shiraz special bin. It was modelled on the 1966, there were only two of them. Now, that was the first wine out of Kunora ever to cost more than $1,000 a bottle. And we were expecting a little bit of flack, but there's adulation. Isn't this a wonderful thing for Kunora? So big bad penfolds again, does Kunawara, you know, Sets the scene and, and others follow in the way. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, that's happened quite a bit with a lot of the wines. You know, you look at the pricing in the secondary market, lots of things have crept up. Well, we might have done that initially first, but everyone wins. Lots of people are sharing that stage now, but there's a confidence. Like, as an example, in Rewards of Patience, the book I referred to recently, 
the 52 and the 53 Grange globally, when poured, are still getting 70 plus years later, 98, mm. 99, 100 point scores. Now, who cares because there are so few of those bottles, but what it does, again, I used the term oh, earlier, yes. the halo effect shines this light across all things Australian in markets where Australian wine was only lots of fruit and lots mm. of flavour and good value for money. Mm. People are now saying, oh, hang on, these are serious collectibles. These are mm. sellable wines. Our recorking clinics around the planet, it's one thing selling wine. We go back and people are bringing their wines out of their cellars to have recorked in Zurich, in Munich, in mm. London, in Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, Taipei, Singapore, Hong Kong. We do these right around the world. Now, this is again adding you know, value to the secondary worth mm. in markets auctions for Australian wine. So the flow and effects, the costs are enormous for us, but it's dragging the imagery. You know, we've been through a bit of a low period of oh, Australian wines, too alcoholic, too oaky, too sweet, too this, too that. Exaggerations, you know, on steroids, blah, blah, blah. Well, not all of them. And that's what we've been doing continuously. And other companies are doing it now as well in Australia, mm. which is wonderful. It's not just the London Wine Trade Fair. It's not just Provine. It's not just Bin Expo. Mm. People are out there all the time pouring Australian wine and, yeah, everyone wins. And it goes all the way down the supply chain. So if we can sell wines for over a 1,000 a bottle, the grape growers, there should be a flow-on effect. Of you course, know, we're hearing yeah. about all the woes of the industry currently and the China thing and mm. whatever. But, you know, we don't look at too many of the positives too often. Bad news is a lot easier to sell than good news. Oh, of course. And yeah, it's a much yeah. more attractive concept as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems Penfolds, obviously, is just they're remarkable brand managers. Rem like every single move from the recorking clinics, um, uh, it fascinates people. But for me, it's that uh, fascination around after-sales service. That's The that's, ultimate. Yeah. That's incredible. And after 34 years, it's still free. You can go in with one bottle, 10 bottles, 100 bottles. You book in an appointment, as you would at the doctor's a clinic, and it's free. Does anyone else do that? Is there, is, um, there the other... Latour and the odd growth in Bordeaux would recork, but you, you know, in New York, London, you knock on the door, you drop your bottle off, you come back a day or two later and it's recorked. Ours, of course, is very interactive. They get to taste their wine. Mm. The whole experience, they're talking to a winemaker, they're getting the mm. stories. It's a very different interactional experience. Do you think Penfolds has outgrown South Australia or outgrown Australia? No, no, I mean, no, no. Obviously, no, you're no. moving the facility across, but the story obviously changes when you're starting to obviously sell a, a wine that actually comes from multiple terroirs, which you've already been doing for yeah. a while. Yeah. But yeah. now expanding that, that uh, resolution, you know, all the way out to, yeah. you know, multiple countries. Well, it, it's funny, you know, like here we are in the bowels of the McGill Winery, underground almost, and we had the AGM of the great wine capitals here not long back. So, you know, even though we're working in Bordeaux, we bought the Blue Bloods of Bordeaux here. And I think that's part of modern day business practice. It's just that, say, if, like I, I'm in awe of the Harlan operation in America with Bond and Primetree mm. and Harlan, you know, just an incredible. But all what they're doing is very close. What we're doing is we have satellites, yeah. you know, around. So I, I still think we can conform to the mantra of the wine comes first keep it real, maintain house style, and continue that Penfold sort of proposition, I think it's possible. How much, how much of these ideas just kind of like, you, you launch them without any sort of data as to whether they're gonna work, and then you just kind of like, well, we didn't expect that to happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mentioned Ed Carr earlier, leaving in 93, House of Barass and that now, he had a great saying, no guts, no glory. You so know, just go for it. Well, sometimes you have to, and that induces, it's not arrogance, but it's, it's speed to market, it's reactivity, it's lots of things. And sometimes we have the odd thing about, you know, something that will come out soon, we're only hoping no one comes out before us. Not to, you know, we can't be the first past the post all the time, but a lot of ideas are good, a lot of ideas are quite great, brave, silly, foolish, but um, you don't want to be beaten to the post, you know, so... It is nice just going for it sometimes in a courageous way. And look, you could do 500,000 market research sort of things and whatever, and you just chase your tail and 
sometimes you have to have belief in what you're doing. And if the wine, it, it gets again back to what's in the glass. If the wine speaks as it should, if it expresses what it's meant to, uh, regardless of sourcing approach or whatever, like that V Chardonnay, wow. In fact, I opened a bottle, I ended up showing it to, who was it, to Wine Advocate, Robert Parker's Wine of Advocate. Course, yeah. It only been, and I, I think I made the mistake that Max Schubert made with Grange. You know, the hidden Granges. Yeah. I am sure Max Schubert retrospectively showed those earlier Granges because of excitement too early. Right. So these are wines still coming together. People say at the time they're misunderstood. Now, yeah, they're very different to other Australian wines, but I'm pretty sure he was showing people Grange that was raw, you know, right. literally not long bottled and, and, and. And I made the same mistake with Kim showing Wine Advocate the mm. Chardonnay two weeks. It was still recovering from bottling and pumped up on SO2 or whatever. And I was a bit, it got 99 points. So, you know, like, if I only had waited two weeks, it might have, got, <laughs> might have gotten 101 points. Then again, it might not. But I looked at the bottle only two weeks ago and I thought, wow, this is much better than it was then. Mm. But, you know, you can't wait, 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 wait. You know, in some years, grain should probably be released as a 22-year-old wine. Mm. In other years, and less of vintages, it should be released as a four or five-year-old. But commercially, we've got to sell wine too, and it is a business at the end of the day. And, you know, the book hasn't been written yet. You know, there are no absolutes in wines. That's one of my throwaway lines. There are no absolutes. How much do points matter? Points matter enormously, and anyone who says they don't, they're, they're <laughs> believing, they're head believing their own press. <laughs> uh, look, it's endorsement. And um, I follow certain journalists who I respect personally, because again, wine collector, big time, mm. tragic, can't retire, can't afford to spend too much money on wine. I'm a very sad case. But um, I can't taste 50,000 wines a year. So mm. I follow certain journalists, I create my own shortlist, and then mm. I'll ultimately, before buying a case, will buy a bottle and see if I agree and, you know, and that's someone who's quite learned in the way of wine. Um, I've had very little, very few misses in my day collecting. Mm. And I say to other people when I talk about something or whatever, what's the worst case scenario of something that didn't quite, you know, you might have to drink it. Wouldn't that Whoops. be awful? Oh, oh, I might have to drink it. <laughs> and ultimately you're drinking those wines anyway. And the story that I always tell is at dinner parties, and we don't have too many anymore, but the odd one, and I say to people, I'll leave the price tags on bottles of wine. At dinner party, you can't do that, Peter. That's a bit gauche. You can't leave price tags on bottles. I say, yes, you can. That's a $4,000 bottle of wine, but it reads $11.99. When I bought it, it doesn't hurt as you drink it. You know? <laughs> and those stories, I think, for people who aren't into collecting and aren't into, oh, oh, you mean you do that? Yeah, of course I do that. You know. Too many wines are too expensive, but mm. the really expensive wines I still, I have a cellar in Melbourne, cellar, personal cellar here in Adelaide. And most of those wines, the Penfold wines, I bought before I joined Penfolds all those years ago from the 50s and whatever, and they didn't cost that much then. They were mm. still very expensive in a relative sense. Of course. But this is the thing I do worry about. Yeah, it's a bit like mortgages and this cost mm. of living problem at the moment. Uh, what are the wines that people can buy a case or two of now that will go the distance for people to go on the journey? Because I learned via, you know, experience and hard knocks mm. and I was very, very lucky. But I do worry about a lot of people getting into the world of wine. Mm. How do they learn? Is it all on social media? Is it mm. all whatever? The, you know, them going on that journey organoleptically themselves, it's very expensive now to look at those benchmarks. Or maybe there are new benchmarks not discovered that aren't expensive, but I don't think as often. You know, in the days of Lynn Evans and, mm. you know, the great James Halliday still with us, you know, collecting enormously great wines, a lot of what they bought in the 60s and 70s, a lot of what I bought in the 70s, didn't cost much money. Mm. Now, you can build houses with those wines. Absolutely. So yeah. do you see wine for young people now is more of an investment or do you reckon that sort of growth is? I think, look, in, in some ways for all wine lovers, there's an element of drinking investment and then just mm. drinking in a head and mm. stick, buying to drink and mm. the old stats, all wine purchase, 92% of it's consumed within 24 hours mm. of the acquisition sort of stuff. So we get obsessed about sellers. But I think that's a good way of drinking longer term, less expensively than just going somewhere and paying full toad odds. Mm. I still don't understand the secondary market system where you're paying top dollar for wines of unknown providence. 
Mm. You're taking an enormous risk buying that wine at that price. Mm. You don't know where is it's Is this there. a big, big sort of driver of the recorking clinics, is ensuring um, the provenance is protected? Yeah, for us it was more a matter of, in the old days of, you know, the, the butler's thief, not the butler's thief, the Wait, what, uh, waiter's friend. Waiter's friend. You know, butler's people thief. Would, I like yeah, the butler's thief. Yeah, butler's thief are good, <laughs> they're too prong. But, you know, you'd leave it the cork and it crumble, and, oh, penfold corks, and we're, yeah. our corks are as bad as anyone's. We mm. try and get the best we can, but... It was a way of looking after the corks and their cellaring investments. Mm. So taking them on the journey, like our competitors love Penfold Recorking Clinics because we've educated their clientele too across a third of a century, you know, about not just buying wine, but storing it properly, of opening course. it properly, decanting it properly. This is all part of the discourse during these recorking clinic sessions. It's not just putting a new cork into an old bottle. Mm. You know, it's about the whole story of storage. And, and it's now generational. We have children who are, you know, in on prams years ago, bringing their children in now. We've got photographs of this generational thing. So I'm not making this up. Um, but, yeah, that quest to just do it better. You know, recorking clinics have helped a lot of that. Uh, in the old days, our wine schools, you know, we're out. I'm doing some Langton's uh, dinners coming up for 707 Verticals. I can guarantee... These won't all be attended by people with grey hair. There'll mm. be lots of young people at the Langton 707 vertical sessions. And, and, and globally, you know, we'll be soon back into the UK, back into Europe, back into China, back into the Americas, just spreading the word of uh, this thing called Australian wine. The, obviously, Pinfolds is such a, um, you know, the focus on uh, diversifying risk from an agricultural standpoint. Yep. It's yep. fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, the perception within Australia, or at least within uh, the groups that I associate with, is often Penfolds is drunk by a particular core demographic. Mm. But is it because you have just such a wide spread of distribution that you can move into various markets as they go through trends and old trends get revived again that you can actually continue to always service those markets? Yeah. Or are you sort of quite concerned that maybe oh, you, you might have an older demographic die off and then suddenly mm. you're exposed? I think. In all areas of everything, not just wine, you, you have to create new markets on an ongoing basis. But we have, in the Americas, trained distributors that often. I, but, you know, whenever I do, in the Americas, training sessions for distributors, and you know that half of them aren't going to be there next year, they'll be with another distributor, mm -hmm. whatever. We've got long-standing relationships with these people. We brought them to Australia, and mm -hmm. even though they've changed companies, they still know about our wine, so mm -hmm. that message has been spread. But in other countries now, like for example in France, uh, we we're working through an agency, which the Tino relationship came about and initially. They were our agents in France for a while. Now we're working for La Place de Bordeaux, which is a different route to market. So this isn't a static thing, it's a dynamic. Mm. And you're just always looking at different and better ways of getting to different parts of the world. And it's easy to sell a case of wine anywhere. Yeah. But what about next year? What about the year after? What about the, you know, that's the challenge. It's funny, I interviewed Larry Lockshin uh, not that long ago, and he um, uh, talked about the need for wine brands and successful wine brands to just continue to engage with new mm. customers all the time because yeah. there is attrition rate, there is, there's always new, new customers just Absolutely. in general. Absolutely, yeah. What Definitely. would be your advice to another wine brand, a budding young winemaker, for example? How, how do you reckon <laughs> they, would, that, they would go about growing their wine brand? Well, I think the old term USP, unique selling proposition, you know, like... Penfolds talk about house style and blends a lot because we That's do a lot thing. of that. You know, we do do the terroir thing, the sense of place thing as well with our single block, single vineyard releases. But if you've got a little small winery and, you know, a vineyard, terroir, 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 mm. sense of place, uniqueness, you know, that sort of messaging. But I think too often people take off too big a hunk of, and even for us now in the Americas, we went for all of America, all those, and now mm. we're just zooming into particular markets within that. Mm. And then one day we'll expand a state at a time again. So I think it's just not biting off more than you can chew in many ways. Um, but not taking the extreme that, say, the Bordelais did for years, that only sold to one or two or three restaurants in Paris, and then all of a sudden worried were worried why they weren't selling wine when one or two or three of those mm. restaurants closed down. You know, to your point, you have to keep it moving all the time. But just small little segments, mm. 
do it properly, over deliver, which is a word we're not allowed to use now corporately. Really? <laughs> no, I'm just making that up. <laughs> <laughs> Wine making too, but corporately. Oh, don't over deliver. Oh, don't over deliver. Don't set the yeah, expectation yeah, 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 yeah. low. <laughs> no, no, I mean in a monetary, but you know, try and, and that's 389's yeah. claim to fame. You know, Penfold's big and bad. Why do people collect 389? Why is it officially? It oscillates mm. with Grange, the most collectible red wine in Australia. Mm. You know, because the track record, because it was over delivered and still is. And it's accessible. And it's accessible and you can buy it and get it. But it doesn't do very well in restaurants. And why? Simple reason. They know down the corner you can buy it for that amount of money to the cent. And why am I going to pay a 20, 30, 40% markup in a restaurant? Course, yeah, yeah. So those sorts of things work against you. If you're a small winery too, I think a lot of them go to the on-license route to market and then realise restaurants don't always pay their money and that gets difficult mm. and it's hard servicing. It's a lovely showcase, brilliant, but you need to work out a business plan of how much goes to that channel, how much mm. goes to retail, how much in an ideal world it would be the Wendere model, wouldn't it? Of course. Mail order only, have them queuing up. 150 know. bucks a bottle. Wow. It's all pre-sold. Gone. Yeah, yeah. But that's, you know, not too many people can do that. A few do, but not too many. So you've got to keep moving. You keep moving mm. a lot. Mm. Yeah. You've probably yeah. racked up more frequent flyer miles, I think, than any <laughs> winemaker in the country. I've got a few. <laughs> How do you remain well rested when you rock up to Paris overnight and you have to jet off to New York? you know, for one or two days. Well, those sorts of moving. things, yeah. I say you don't get jet lag if you don't sleep. <laughs> so I'm a bit of a camel, but I do need sleep. I ultimately do have to drink. I ultimately do have to sleep. But no, I think sometimes you're doing things that your head hurts. And I can remember once being really scared. And th this is a true story too. Like you hear of out of body experiences, you know when you really shouldn't be doing it, where you listen to this fellow talk and you think, I agree with most of the things he's saying. Then you're listening, you, you, you realise you're about half a second out of sync and you're listening to yourself. <laughs> I'm too tired. Like, I'm listening to what I'm saying. I'm about half a second out of kilter here. That's when you're really, really tired. But no, and you're trying to tell me something. I try to, uh, but the, the, the thing is, though, too, and, and it's a funny thing, um, you know, again, with some of the, 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 the junior winemakers and that, oh, what do we say? What do we say? Mm. You know, what do we do? What do we do? We'll just tell it as it is. Mm. And if things are real, you don't have to remember. You just tell it as it is. Mm. And that's a great mnemonic in terms of the mm. way of conducting and not towing the line necessarily, but what was it, 14% or 12%? Was it this oak? Was it that mm. oak? Well, just tell it as you remember it. Tell it for real. Mm. And it, it's an interesting one. The other one, I, I, I got up and tell those, some of the winemakers, oh, we've got this really big dinner. What do we do? And, oh, you know, and, and I say to them, because some of them have bad experiences, and I say, you never look at the last dinner you spoke at and how well it went. You look at the last 10. Mm. And if you feel good about six or seven dinners out of the 10, you're doing really well. Eight dinners out of 10, you're exceptional. Nine or 10 dinners really well out of 10, you're a liar. It doesn't happen. <laughs> it doesn't happen. And that's what people have to remember. You know, things click, they don't click. You have good and bad audiences. And, but spreading the word on wine isn't quite as natural as it should be for people mm. who you're speaking to who are there as a guest or they're not into wine like we are. Of course. And we have to remember that. And that's a hard thing. Like, you'll talk for, say, a group, the Institute of Masters of Wine, for example, you know, I did once, um, I've spoken to many times, but the Forging Links uh, Symposium in Bordeaux, mm -hmm. people said, oh, 220, you know, Jancis Robin, they're all there. That must have been so hard, I don't know. One of the easiest talks you ever give. Because they're already, they're already wine In that bandwidth, there. you yeah. only have to go to that and you're in it. The mm. hard ones are where you've got people who are the cognoscenti and then others who are bored silly, who aren't eating, and you've got to do that. They're the hard ones. Those are the best, the easiest. Yeah. Like, have you ever had any, uh, I imagine, just because you are who you are and you've been here long enough, have you had many sort of brisks with celebrity that have kind of fallen flat? Oh, look, you, you do have all sorts of things happen. I'll give you the most humiliating thing that it wasn't. Uh, David Grohl and Pat yep. Smears, two of the original for Nirvana Foo Fighters now, but they came one time and they come when they're visiting and, you know, we catch up. But one time they bought Jack Black here, the actor Jack Black, you know, School of Rock no, and whatever. Not very well. So not we, personally, we, though. <laughs> we had a little tasting A4 placemat that Jane put together. And I kept his placemat, but I don't know where it is now. And if he liked something, it was yum. If he really liked it, it was yum, yum. And one wine got yum, yum, exclamation mark. 
But he didn't even get to the final line. He got a bit bored by it all. And we're, you know, and he went out the front and just played with his frisbee on the lawn. <laughs> so <laughs> I thought, gee, he was really enraptured by it. But he was in New Zealand not so long back with a friend of mine who's the CFO for Michael Gadinsky in, mm -hmm. you know, Frontier Touring Mushroom. And uh, he caught up with him. He said, oh, that tasting of Penfolds, that was amazing that time. And here I am all those years <laughs> thinking, oh, fail, fail, fail. <laughs> he was so bored he went out the front and just played with his Frisbee. You know, true story. You can't make those up. So are you often pulled out in front of celebrity all the time? Oh, no, no, it just depends, just depends. I've been very fortunate being on the road so often in so many places. Yeah, you know, sporting people, music people, royalty and that mm. sort of thing. And that happens because of why, not because of me. Mm. You know, very fortunate to be interfacing with all sorts of people. Have you ever encountered someone who has just blown you away with their wine knowledge and didn't realise how much of a nerd they were? <laughs> no, not so much that, but we've all experienced it. And they, oh, I don't know much about wine. It's a bit like the Japanese, oh, I don't mm. speak good English. And, they, and then they speak better English than you and of I course. at the end. And it's the same with these people who know nothing about wine. And they know it to like 98 decimal places. And I've not been caught out by that, but I've been intrigued and bemused by that. Mm. But I don't think we've ever sort of fallen flat because, like, as we're talking now, I was in Solidor this morning and I was called over to speak to some people. I speak to wine, I find it a very sociologically correct levelling thing. Mm. So, yeah, I might use the odd fancier word with a certain demographic, but not really. You know, mm. terms I banded them around. I always pre-warn people when I'm going to say organoleptic or when I'm going to say a word and warn them, you know. And you just tell it as it is, and that way it doesn't matter who they are. And the great people of the world, all the multi-billionaire types, whatever, are more down to earth than we are. That's why they're so successful, with very few exceptions. There mm. are exceptions, but very few. It seems that the love of wine can be really hindered by a lack of confidence more so than a lack of knowledge. Mm. When you encounter people that have very low confidence, although they might have a lot of knowledge like that, what's the sort of advice that you would often give to them? Well, again, ad nauseum scratch record here, I do it at lots of dinners with top bankers or whatever, two glasses of wine. A preference of one over the other, you're an automatic wine expert. That's all you need to know, which one you prefer. Now, if you're in the wine business, you have to offer descriptors and reasons why the preference is it is, but as a wine lover, hedonistically, just a preference. And there are no winners or losers. So you go through just the simple stuff. Dr. Patrick Ireland from the University of Adelaide, he and I have put some books together with, in recent times, Andrew Calliart and Dr. Peter Dry. And the nature of those books is to add lots of graphics and to demystify, make it simple make each page sort of self-explanatory where you don't have to work from start to finish, mm. you know, to sort of, yeah, just not make it this thing for the chosen few. Uh, and that's been a pursuit of mine all the way through. See, I was mentored, uh, counselled, call it what you will, taught by people who were already up there when I started tasting wine as someone who knew nothing. You know, mum and dad, they'll have a glass of wine here and there, but I'll drop a bottle of wine off, go back two months later, it's still in the fridge. You know, like, the, they'll drink wine, but when I'm there to make me feel good, probably. <laughs> I'm not from this, you know, multi-generational thing. So I know what it's like to sort of be learning in a cognitive sense about it. And there used to be so much bluff and so much whatever, and people were waylaid so easily, and mm. just to give them the right path. It's a bit like your tennis serve, doing it properly, it takes forever, but then you've got it, or your golf swing or whatever. Learning about wine in a cognitive, Piagetian way almost, mm. properly, is uh, the way to go, but if only that were to occur. But the school of hard knocks and, you know, tasting experientially is good fun too, so I don't want to sound too academic here. Yeah. Well, Peter, we are basically at time. I reckon, is there anything else that you love to add? Oh, take us another two days, I think. <laughs> <laughs> right, thank you very much. No, no, pleasure. Sorry, I was to it. <laughs>